All right, we should be good to go. Yes. Okay. Just looking to see if it's going to come up on here. I'll get any seconds. Hello, everybody. Welcome to week two of the Operations and Services Reopening Work Group. This June 11, 2020 meeting of the Operations and Services Reopening Work Group is being called to order at 5 p.m. These meetings are public meetings to provide transparency and the opportunity for the public to engage in the process. In order to enable every participant to have a voice in the process, public comment will be accepted via email at reopen.us at doe.k12.us or voicemail at 303-733-0244. Comments and ideas will be forwarded to the respective work groups for review and as well. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a brief view of our agenda for today. And again, welcome. I'm one of the co-chairs, Chuck Longfellow, Delaware Department of Education, Associate Secretary for Operations Support. Our other co-chair is Oliver Gums, the Director of Business and Operations for Cape Henlopen School District. And uh, we have Andrew Buer from Opportunity Labs Foundation with us as a partner. Next slide, please. We'll revisit some of our ground rules. Everyone has a voice. Stay focused, be succinct. If you're gonna piggyback, you don't, you don't have to restate the person's entire position. Just go ahead and expand on the idea. We use the hand raise feature in WebEx, and we may need to compromise on some things. Next slide, please. Again, we welcome public comment, and here's the email address for ideas. We, um, we may be able to see, if you do the chat in YouTube, if you're one of our YouTube watchers, we may be able to see what you're uh, posting, we may not, but it really, it's not official public comment unless we either get it through reopening ideas at doe.k12.de.us or via the voicemail 302-735-4244. We do transcribe all of those comments and we forward them to the work groups. Uh, we also post them on DOE's reopening page. So if you go to uh, www.doe.k12.de.us, that is the Department of Education webpage. And you notice underneath DOE Maine, there's a red link that says COVID-19. If you click on that, and then scroll down a little bit where you see the words school reopening working groups in um, a bold black header. Underneath it says three COVID-19 school reopening working groups. Click on that link and you'll get all kinds of resources. You'll see um, the public comment that we've received to date You'll see the schedule of all of the upcoming meetings. You will see um, recorded YouTube live streams, the presentations, the transcripts, um, including the chat transcripts and members of the groups. If you are um, one of our YouTube people today and you wanna find the slide deck that we're looking at, if you go to the State of Delaware Public Meeting Calendar, just Google that in State of Delaware Public Meeting Calendar, look at tonight's meeting, Click on the link and you'll see a link that says document and you can get a PDF of the slides that our committee is looking at tonight. Next slide, please. All right, um, we won't reintroduce ourselves, but if we can go down the list, left side, left column first, and just uh, everybody, if you're here, just say your name so that we're doing kind of a roll call. Um, I'd appreciate that. I guess that means me first. Heath Chasanoff, Superintendent Woodbridge. Sherry Kiyaki, Principal of Caesar Rodney High School. David Hearn, Athletic Director, Teacher, and a Coach at Delmar High School. Stacey Clark, Director of Instruction and Student Services at First State Military Academy. Natasha Vera, Supervisor of Transportation, Seaford School District. Gerald Allen, Director of School Operation and Personnel for Newcastle County Protect School District. 
Christine Bewley, Manager of Information Systems for the Red Clay Consolidated School District representing technology. We have Liaga Wright. Oh, there she goes. Liaga Wright, Indian River School District board member. You can see the screen. I know she's. I know she's here. She's. She's dialed in. Uh, Jeff. We can hear you now. Okay, yeah, Perry Nash Wilson with the Office of Management and Budget. And then Jeff Tashner, Executive Director of the Iowa State Education Assistance Program. Thank you. I don't know if, um, Mike, are you here tonight? Not yet. I know some of our legislators had expressed that they might still be in session by the time this starts, so I don't know if we have any of our um, our legislators are not represented. Thanks. Are you here? Dave, Sic Dave Sicola, state senator. I am here. Thank you. Charles Postles, I am here. Excellent. And no, no Dave Lawson yet? Not yet. Okay, we'll drive on. Next few slides, uh, Oliver will take us uh, through our purpose again, just to remind, just to ground us again and our time. And I am Oliver Gums, Director of Business Operations for the Cape Penn Open School District, your co-chair and uh, Chuck's host with the most. Uh, so to review our purpose again, is to deliver a high level framework to the Secretary of Education that includes public health considerations to help superintendents, charter leads and uh, principals in their planning work. The committee will not make recommendations about whether schools should open up for in-person instruction. That is a decision made by the governor and the public health experts. Next slide, please. This framework will include recommendations on what needs to be done. The how details are outside of the scope of this committee. However, your comments and public comments will be available to those making the how decisions. Uh, we will review scenario based planning, the scenario based planning document in the context of operations and services. And the planning documents are not set in stone and are meant to be edited to meet our needs for our opening Delaware schools. Next slide. Just a review of our timeline. Last week we talked about this, uh, scenario one, which uh, dealt with minimal spread. We will review that um, as part of our discussion today. And then we will transition into minimal to moderate spread for this meeting and our next meeting on the 18th. On June 25th, the plan is to discuss scenario number three, which is substantial spread. And then on July 2nd, we would like to finalize our recommendations. Uh, before each meeting, we'll read the scenario materials and public comment uh, to make sure that we are incorporating that in all of our thought processes for making recommendations. Next slide, please. I think that's on you, Chuck, unless Andrew is uh, doing that one. Um, that's me, that's me. Okay, next three slides are a brief review of um, changes that we made to our, um, our draft from last time. So I sent the committee um, the document with these added, this, the, um, the original uh, minimal spread document with these I think it's either 16 or 17 items added. So what I'd like to do right now, it's about 5.11, maybe take 15 minutes max, um, more if we really deeply need it, but um, just to go through these and see, hey, did we, did we um, hit the mark on the suggestions that committee members had from last time? Did we miss anything? Um, is, did, we, did we list something that really is not necessarily something we need to consider for the minimal spread um, scenario. So, Alyssa, you're showing um, slide 10 right now, and we've seen that for a little bit. Let's look at 11 and 12 for just a few seconds each, you know, enough time to let, let the uh, public take a look at those and the committee take a look at those. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go back to 10 and start our discussion.
We want to make sure that we captured your thoughts accurately and completely um, to be worked into the um, draft recommendations. Okay, next slide. Okay, let's go back to 10, just to park there for a few minutes. Do we have any um, hands yet for anybody who would like to make a comment on any of these um, additions that we had from last time? Not yet. Okay. We'll give it another uh, minute or two. I especially like the one about making broadband a utility. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite. I'll piggyback on that, Chuck, and as, as you're aware, my thought was, you know, we have a National Guard that is uh, adept at building things very quickly for the military. I'm not sure why they wouldn't be able to help if somebody put them to the test to help build the towers for that, but I know that's a part of the how, but I, I just felt the need to say it. Chuck, we do have Natasha who would like to talk. Okay, Natasha. Good evening. Um, for this slide under, um, I have some notes here. Um, possible, um, probably should add, um, assess under whether the, there should be any bus contractors that have, in, that have been impacted. Um, the number, the first bullet, um, maybe we can survey the contractors to see how many bus drivers will be returning with minimum spread and how many bus drivers they have um, in training. And also, maybe we can add it, we can make plans if there's a shortage of drivers and how those routes will be covered until drivers are secured. All right. When you say training, you mean in the training pipeline? Yeah, how many are in the wings for training um, new bus drivers that are, have been waiting that haven't received their CDLs yet um, because DMV has been, um, they've stopped training. Just like our uh, students who need driver's ed, right? Same situation. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> um, and I do have another one under bullet three, if I can. Okay. Yeah, keep going. Um, the concern is about using dark transportation um, because we don't know who the students will come in contact with and who they may be exposed to um, if someone who may have COVID while riding the dark bus. So riding on the buses and um, providing better tracing of who the students were in contact with, that would be a concern. Also, um, DART buses are not designated with the same safety standards as the school bus. Um, so as far as the safety is for the student, we would need the parent um, permission, um, maybe to sign off or give permission for them to opt to ride a DART bus versus the school bus. Okay. Noted, definitely noted that. Any more, Natasha? Nope, <laughs> not into this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, we're going to get to your slides tonight. I know that. Um, yeah. I'm... <laughs> how about uh, any other hands? No other hands right now. Okay, let's just give it another 15 seconds to see if anybody has anything, and then we'll we'll move on to slide 13. Uh, Christine would like to talk. Okay, Christine, go ahead. Um, so if we can go back to slide 11. So um, after the meeting, the, the recommendation about the technology help desk um, was a really good recommendation. I was thinking about the best way that that can work for some bigger districts or smaller districts or single schools. Um, so if we can rework that to, de to develop a um, technology support plan for families, because that could include a hotline, uh, an email box, some um, information on the web, even open hours at a school for like drop-ins um, for on-site support. So just a general technology support plan for families. Um, and then the one thing that's not on here that was in the document that you had sent to us was about um, assessing the status of all devices. And that... I think that needs to be expanded more, not just devices, but um, 
um, other peripherals that are going to be needed coming back in August. So just assessing technology needs, like are we are you going to need extra chargers, or are you going to need um, the um, peripherals that are going to be needed to make sure um, you're able to support anything that was lent to students over um, the springtime. That was all I had. So devices, peripherals, and accessories coming back. Okay. Yep. Assess the staff. And just making sure that if you if the do now or before school opens is to order them so they're on site so you're not kind of behind the, the ball coming come August when kids come back. All right, excellent. Any other hands? Yes, Jeff would like to speak. Okay, Jeff. Yeah, Chuck, one of the things we talked about um, last week was we've got custodial staff that obviously have their typical routine in preparing buildings to go back to school. And when we're talking about some of what the additional requirements are, is really now being able to assess the capability of staff to do the normal reopening routine uh, with the additional requirements on top of that. And I know we had talked about that. I made a note of it, but I didn't see it in here anywhere. You know, just the ability to do everything we normally do to prepare buildings over the summer. I'm thinking about like all the stripping of floors, waxing of floors, other stuff they do when they're not occupied with everything else we're going to ask them to do to prepare for reopening in a minimal minimal spread scenario to address um, the COVID-19 situation. So I didn't want that to go without recognition. That's a good one. And I'll add another one for this and for, and, and we don't have to stop adding stuff to this. You can always, you know, email the additional things uh, in between meetings, but I was really thinking of it in the context of tonight's discussion with custodians, but I'll put it here too, is we need to assess um, our, the availability to augment our custodial staff with additional um, employees or contractors, um, substitutes, because, I mean, it's depending on the amount that is recommended by the CDC that needs to be done in addition to the normal custodial workload, we're going to need people to get that work done. Yeah. Just to piggyback on that, that's, um, you know, that's like coming up with a custodial plan for this. And um, we need to be able to use all of our resources because uh, we'll probably need to do things in the classroom. So. Um, school districts will need to think about, you know, what happens at the end of each class. Is there a wipe down to help augment what the what the uh, custodians are doing or not? Um, and that would mean using additional staff uh, or custodians if you had substitutes. But you know, maybe the paras that are floating in out of the room or the teachers. You know, those are things that districts have to think about. There's there's obviously going to need to be some changes and some flexibility. On, uh, on how to keep everybody safe and, and take care of the cleaning measures. Yeah. yeah, OJ, that's what I'm talking about. There's going to be more work, there's going to be different work, and then there's going to be the work that we normally do. So, mm -hmm. to figure out what that all is, anticipating it now, and then figuring out, you know, do we have the capability to do it, or are jobs going to be different for some people? I think it's something that we would all be um, better off if we figured that out sooner rather than later. And I think, you know, as we move into the operations section and we talk about the HR role in it, you know, they would uh, play a big part in, you know, the training plans and the staffing plans related to this. Chuck, we have one more hand. David, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, this one uh, overlaps almost. It follows up on everything that you guys are saying with buses, with custodians. But it's uh, athletics extracurriculars. It's uh, we kind of have sparred around it uh, last week and so far tonight. But it's it's going to be one that affects thousands of kids uh, up and down the state. Parents, uh, officials, the custodians in our buildings will be swamped with everything else they're doing. And then you got locker rooms, practice fields, uh, portable toilets, outside bathrooms, all those things. If athletics goes. Yeah, I, I know DIAA had a meeting today and it was a major topic for them is, you know, what are we going to do next? And we're waiting for the governor next week, but uh, that'll be a major topic that had, we've been discussing it as ADs in the state for weeks. 
and our list is so long over what do we need to do now? What do we need in the way of masks? What do we need in the way of hand sanitizers and on and on and on? It is an enormous list and that doesn't even get into all the things we've discussed so far, but it's one that has to kind of fit in there with it because if we're in school and it's, uh, this is saying normal, kind of normal-ish, whatever that is, that'll become an enormous topic too connected to school and it'll be after school and the developing a schedule for after school hours and what do the buses do on the way to games and so on and so on. And for the review of minimal spread. Okay, seeing none, let's move on to slide 13. And this will be um, our, our, we'll start our discussion of what we call scenario two, which is minimal to moderate community spread. I'm going to do my best to explain, um, you know, to set the stage for this scenario, what moderate community spread is and looks like. When we talked about the, um, the R naught, that is the um, degree of, um, of spread, that's near, that's going to be near one in this case. Looking at a 14 day trend of positive tests increasing, public health capacity is stressed. Um, testing capacity might be inadequate. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's, a, that's an increase of, um, of spread and um, just overall stress and infection in the community. Next slide, please. To keep communities safe, we switch from just watching things to actually actively mitigating. We um, should be prepared as schools to implement social distancing, including reducing large gatherings. Right now, you see that we're starting to open things up and, and allow um, incrementally larger gatherings. But um, in this scenario, we're starting to close that again, alter schedules, limit um, interactions, and deploy distance learning. Next slide. Uh, it may involve short-term dismissals of two to five days, suspension of extracurriculars if, um, if um, spread starts to grow, and um, students and teachers um, at increased risk. Um, school operation is, um, is um, predicted to be situation dependent in this. So you might have you know, some hot spots in one part of the state and not the others. Um, you might have one school that has a flare-up, you know, it, that's the kind of situation we're looking at. Um, Andrew, just wanted to see if I nailed that or if um, you have anything else to add to this. Yeah, the only other thing I would add, Chuck, is that this aligns with phase one to two of Delaware's reopening plan. Um, and so, you know, depending on uh, the level of community spread, um, whether it's closer to minimal or, or closer to moderate, it's going to line up pretty consistently with uh, with Delaware's phase one or phase two uh, of its state reopening plan. All right, next slide. So now we're going to start to get into it. Scenario two, this is the uh, minimal to moderate spread scenario. Schools may open and operate situation dependent with a series of active mitigation measures in place. So as we go through these, now we're doing two of the four protocols tonight. We're doing facilities and transportation. <clears throat> we're gonna save operations and technology for next week. So um, <clears throat> we um, wanna consider what should be added to this list of essential actions, just like we did last time. Should any of, any of them be deprioritized? Should anything be reordered? Um, last time we had do now, we do before school opens and do once school opens. I think it's a little different in this one. We'll look at the headers. Um, but, you know, I think we had a great discussion last time. Let's have another great discussion uh, this time on it. And um, let's uh, move on. So for facilities do now, we have two slides. So let's look at this one for um, a little bit. Look at the next one and then we'll come back. Okay, next slide.
Okay, these are the do nows. Let's let's go back to 17, and um, I'm gonna say again um, what I said with the week one stuff that just assessing your availability of additional custodial um, staff augmentation, substitutes, contractors is something that we should be adding to this list. That's uh, something I wanted to contribute on this one. Do we have any hands at this point, Alyssa? Not right now. Okay. I'm sure we will soon. <laughs> oh, now we do. <laughs> Chris, Christine just raised her hand. So I watched um, the wellness committee meeting from Tuesday night, and there was a lot in there about what the classroom should look like. Are we, do we correlate what they're working on? Because they talked about like barriers at desks and the way like hallways and those kind of things, which I, I think are intertwined with facilities. So is that going to be inter, like, interrelated to what the facility from our group needs to be focusing on? Um, and I might ask Andrew for a little guidance on that. There's, there's a lot of, um, seems like may, potential overlap or, um, you know, some opportunities to collaborate between the two groups. But um, Andrew, do you have a, a perspective on like where our scope starts with facilities and there's their starts? Yeah, that's a good question, Christine, and, and one that I think, you know, is similar to, to something we talked about last week, which is a couple of these uh, issues and, and action items fit within multiple, um, you know, uh, well, multiple categories across multiple work groups, working groups. And so, um, you know, I think where uh, where the um, facilities um, work is most applicable relative to wellness is as they are making recommendations about, you know, what, uh, what PPE should look like. Um, you know, we should be thinking about uh, what that means in terms of operationalizing it. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't think uh, it's in this working group's purview to be thinking about, you know, the the public health protocols. Um, but I do think it's it's uh, it's worth talking through what it would mean um, to actually operationalize some of those things uh, if they are suggested. Um, does that help, Christine? Yeah. So on this slide, where it says audit necessary materials and supply chains, like this is talking about cleaning and disinfecting, but. If they're going to recommend privacy screens and physical barriers for desks, that would then fall on facilities to purchase and make, like obtain and get that installed. Um, so if if that's something they're going forward, it, it probably needs to be incorporated in here. Or even things like the hallways and spacing and like blocking them off, just how they would do that. Um, if that's going to fall on facilities to purchase, it it needs to kind of be on everybody's radar of, of necessary materials. Yeah, we'll make a note um, that that needs to go somewhere. So as far as supply chain and procurement, you know, if, if furniture is needed or storage for furniture, if we have to move desks out or screens um, or it's storage. I think that's an excellent point about um, mentioning something in here about social distancing. Um, I mean, there's need, there need to be markings and furniture needs to be rearranged uh, the question about barriers is a big one uh, because there's probably a plexiglass shortage at this point um, but that is something that facilities um, would need to do now to be operationalized with the thought that we would come back in this scenario and I think given the nature of the different um, variables of what, how they could come with peaks and valleys or a slow burn I think some sort of social distancing needs to be planned on by facilities. So uh, I think we should make a recommendation that they should be looking at, you know, what type of social barriers and markings are needed uh, to get the, the facilities prepared for any scenario that comes back. Chuck, we have two hands, Jeff and then Sherry. Okay. Right, Chuck. Jeff. I'm looking at the third bullet um, and uh, clearly understand it talks about alerting custodial and infection control staff of changes that are needed to address what I'm assuming is a trend in the wrong direction. Um, what I don't see here is 
communication to everybody else that's in the building, um, students, staff, other folks of steps that I think they would probably be expected to take to help contribute to the, the safekeeping of the building. So I would hope that we're not just focusing on custodial staff and infection control staff, but if we were in this area when there were additional steps to take, we'd be communicating to that to all the others that are in that building on a daily basis of what steps that they should be taking to help us keep the building um, in as safe a condition as possible. All right, thank you. All right, the next hand. Sherry, go ahead. Um, looking at the first bullet where it said audit necessary materials, one of the questions my chief custodian posed was, are there recommendations for, for example, like how many um, like hand sanitizer stations or, um, you know, wall mounted units, um, they're recommending like spacing and accessibility. And I know that might be more of the health and wellness committee, but it would, it would definitely affect us and what we would be potentially purchasing, mounting and using from a custodial standpoint if as we kind of re-enter in the fall. All right. And we have one more hand. Heath, go ahead. Okay. I'll piggyback off of what Jeff said. Uh, in terms of, I don't think it's gonna be just communicating with other staff. I think you're also, when you look at the second bullet here, we talk about cleaning after every classroom change. That can't be done by, you know, a three or four person uh, custodial staff. And so um, there's going to have to be, and maybe it's, maybe it's later in, in the document, um, but there's going to have to be some training of all staff on these kind of things. If we're going to be, uh, you know, having class changes, there's going to be times where our parents or teachers, you know, might have spray bottles or, or something like that. So there's going to have to be training for all staff in, 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 in some of these, these cleaning areas. Any other hands on this one? Not for now. I do. I would like to, while we're waiting to see if anybody else wants to make a comment here, I want to point out something that was in the YouTube chat. Uh, we had somebody uh, talk about, you know, the description of the uh, moderate spread scenario said that, you know, only real totally essential people will go in and out of a school building. And the comment was made, you know, by eliminating people from the outside, you could be eliminating agencies that provide um, critical services, before and after care, um, other supports, deliveries, you know, I'm adding to what they said, but um, part of this, and maybe it's not a do now, maybe it's a, um, later on in here, maybe it's operations, is really to assess um, who needs to come into the building and then how do we let them in the building um, so that they can provide services, how do we, um, you know, how do we vet them and screen them? So um, I just saw that and wanted to make sure we didn't lose that. Anything else for do now? Um, if not, we'll move on to slide. Oh, this number is so small. Um, is it 19? 19. Yes. If schools are instructed to close. So we have one slide on this. Um, <clears throat> You know, some, some of these are a little, I think there's not really much meat here. Um, it might be covered by another group. It might be health and wellness. But, you know, um, this is the only slide for facilities if schools are instructed to close. So let's look at this and see if there's anything else we need to, um, to add to it or consider. I think when we talk about schools being instructed to be closed, um, we're absolutely talking about students and staff being in the building, but I think it also needs to morph into the general public uh, being in, to, in the buildings also. I mean, a lot of us use our facilities for facilities use and things like that, so just don't want to lose sight of that fact. We have two hands up. We'll um, have Sherry and then Senator Sokola. 
I think one of the things that could potentially be added here is that um, we have um, visitors adhere to protocols like, you know, signing the COVID assurance, taking temperatures and having those things available. And that is something that we currently have our custodians do like every day when they enter the school. So I think just developing some good habits and being mindful of what those protocols are is important. Next hand. Senator Scola, go ahead. Yeah, I just, since face masks and special respirators is there, we probably should also include um, appropriate gloves. Just a little detail. <clears throat> Okay, any more hands on this one? Yep, um, Representative Postles. Okay, Representative. Yes, um, so I I'm just wanna be, try to understand something. If schools are instructed to close and there are not students and staff there, does that absolutely mean that the buildings aren't used for other public purposes? Uh, because as been mentioned, the schools get uh, you know, a number of different allied groups and and non-allied groups in some cases use the buildings. If if we are at the stage that says schools sh should be closed, uh, does that mean the buildings are are closed also? Because that'll make a big difference in what has to be done in maintaining uh, sanitation in those buildings. I think generally what is happening now, because schools are closed now, that there's no facilities use going on. Um, right. And I don't see it, it doesn't make sense to allow the outside public into the schools if it's not state, um, safe for our children. So I, I would say, and that's why I mentioned before that we, we need to make sure it's clear to the public, um, whether it's through signage or whatever, or whenever the announcements are made that, you know, our facilities are not open for general public use um, when schools are closed. Right. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, one item here could be um, if schools are instructed to close, then we need to notify um, outside groups and go through our building usage processes there. It's a lot more to that than people might know. You know, you could be doing yes. refunds and rescheduling. It's it's a mess. Mm -hmm. All right. Any others with if schools are instructed to close under the moderate? Yep, two more. Heath and then Senator Sokola. Okay. Yeah, I think it's kind of what we went through um, in March and April. There's got to be a determination on who's essential at this point. And so uh, I think that's what Senator Postles was was thinking about as well is, you know, we talk about students and, and staff not being there, but there, there will be, you know, if we're doing food service, you know, we're, we're going to certainly have to have cafeteria workers there and custodians will need to be there. And, and so really, depending on what kind of closure we're at, we'll have to make a determination on who, who, who essentially needs to be there. All right. Excellent. Determine who is essential um, or what functions. Okay, thanks. Next thanks so, so one thing, hey, schools are closed now, but Christina had a referendum this week. And so there are other things that may be, and, and we do have elections coming up in the fall and schools are a very frequent polling place. So, there, there's certainly going to be some at least selective sites that may need uh, unique attention, uh, and so so I would leave. Um, I would assume we're going to still be using those facilities for something at some point. I think uh, there needs to be an evaluation of those type of events that need to occur, like elections. Um, that's a lot different than having an outside group come in to play basketball on the weekend or something like that. But yeah, right. you know, for elections. Um, Schools are not in session um, when there is election anyway, so students aren't there, but you still need to have the protocols for safe distancing and cleaning and things of that nature. So you're absolutely right on that. There are sometimes, even if we are in a shutdown situation, that um, the buildings may need to be used for a public function like a referendum or something like that. Right, food preparation or packaging, all kinds of stuff. Go ahead. 
this may seem like an obvious one, depending on the awareness everybody has, making everybody aware of what's happening. That means kids and staff. I know we're still giving out stuff from kids' lockers, whether it be PE lockers or their school lockers, trying to make sure they take as much of their belongings as they can and necessities for doing virtual schoolwork or whatever the case may be, at least making them aware if we know that they're going to be out for an extended period, that school is closing. They need their materials at home. I think you're right. I know it's kind of like a no brainer that we have to communicate, but it may be worth putting a bullet on here that there needs to be um, some type of communication plan um, developed um, to communicate what we need to communicate to our parents. I know we're all doing it, but just to make sure that, you know, it's in there and we don't forget about it. I mean, you can never understate the importance of communication. And so that's whether it's with, you know, the media, through the internet or what have you, uh, that needs to be done. Thank you. Any other hands for um, instructed to close facilities? Looks like that's it for now. Okay, let's go on to 20 when schools reopen. I might suggest that we take a look also at um, when schools reopen, look at the minimal spread scenario and look at the stuff on there because it may be a repeat of a lot of that. I don't know, what do you all think? I think you're right. There's a lot that we, we do in operations that um, transfers over to this level. Um, and just enhance. Um, so we should look at those things that we are starting uh, in the other scenario. But I mean, we kind of cross cut everything. So it's just really add more to it to um, maintain and, and be more proactive to those things that we were already doing. Any hands for this one? Not yet. Oh, now we have one. Okay. Keith, go ahead. Isn't going to isn't going to uh, depend on where we are when we reopen. You know, in terms of are we are we at minimal to to none? Or are we you know? I think there needs to be some some statement in here that it, it's going to depend on the scenario that we're at right then, in terms of what we're going to do. Right. I know you're going to turn on start turning the lights off. Great. Any other hands for when schools reopen? Nope, we're good to go. Okay. Uh, I just saw an, an interesting one. I'm kind of keeping one eye on the YouTube chat. There's a really interesting one on um, how to conduct uh, safety drills in the event, or you know, fire drill and all that stuff with social distancing. That's an interesting question right there. I don't know if it fits in ours, but um, that's, 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 a that's something to put somewhere. Um, next slide, please. Um, Chuck, we did just have a hand go up. Uh, Jeff, go Nothing. ahead. Go, back. go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, Chuck, and, and I apologize, but it, it hit me here because we're talking about a scenario where we have to shut schools down and then reopen. And I wonder if we need to differentiate between, um, a situation where there's, you know, mild to moderate spread in the community that causes the school to be shut down as opposed to a scenario when there's actually an occurrence of COVID within the building itself. Yeah, that's a great point. Say if mm -hmm. safer reopens after a temporary closure because there was a flare up in a certain, you know, just a, a, a area of the state or something, you know, is that different or is it different if you know you had some cases than if it's just general um, yeah, I mean, it just hit me that there's you know, different triggers for what 
could cause us to have to shut and then reopen and whether or not there needs to be some consideration if it's, you know, external to the building itself, but there's a reason to shut down some of what we experienced, obviously, um, March, April. And then we've probably learned since then that there were people in the buildings at the time that had had, um, you know, had the virus, but in moving forward, if there's a need to close down a, a building in particular, because we now have a staff member or student, somebody who's been there that's been um, identified as someone who has the virus, does that necessitate different steps or different um, safety uh, procedures to be followed into reopening the building? It just, and I don't know the answer, but it just dawned on me and, and maybe it's something that you know, Andrew and his group have considered or not, but I just wanted to put it out there for the group to, to think about. I think it does. I think you're right. Yeah, that, that's kind of a major one because I mean, I mean, if you play your eyes, there's going it, that that scenario is going to happen. You know, it, it's kind of like the easy scenarios that everything gets shut down because there's all, all schools are shut. But what do you do in the instance when you have one school kind of become a hot spot? Where do those kids go? You know, there needs to be a plan for that. Where do the staff go? Um, contact tracing is there. Uh, so there are a lot of issues related to that. And Oliver, I'm thinking about it too from the perspective of, okay, it, it, the virus is out in the community, we shut down, we reopen. There's no reason to be concerned. I mean, not as much reason to be concerned that there's been some sort of exposure in the building, but if we have an actual scenario where we've had exposure in the building, then you know our ability to communicate to the community, to parents, to students, to the staff, that the building's now safe to return to. I mean, it's going to be an entirely different dynamic asking people to return to a building when there may have been a reason to shut down like we currently have that is external to the building as opposed to there was a reason to shut down that's internal to the building itself. Yeah, uh, I think the tough part about it is what's the trigger? I mean, you know, there's going to be more than one or two kids that have an issue. Do you set the building down for, you know, five kids, seven kids? I don't know where that is. And then the, the, the question is, how fast is the response time to mitigate whatever happens? I mean, just in this summer in my district, I the building that I'm working out of um, to do the grab and go food distribution, we've had four custodians test positive. And, and so it all depends on when they test positive and then, you know, do they quarantine? Who were they exposed to? I mean, you can't shut down everything. We didn't shut down, fortunately, um, but we did keep an eye on, you know, who was in contact with those custodians and were they in the areas where we were operating? Um, so that's going to be a tricky one um, to make a determination on when a building needs to shut down and, and for how long. Um, but that is definitely something that we're gonna have to think about it because that uh, has the tendency to cause some mass hysteria. I mean, people are scared of this thing and rightfully so. Um, I mean, that's a difficult one. So I, I wrote down um, plan for known cases in a school and um, plan for how to know that the building is safe to return in addition to some of the other things that were said. And what we do is we, um, Jen Roussel from Department of Education, and um, she'll she'll go through and, and try to get some of the ideas out of here. So I'm taking notes. We have a couple of people taking notes um, in order to capture all this. Any other hands for when schools reopen? Not right now. Okay. All right. So let's move on to um, let's look take a quick look at slide 21. I'll tell you what what we're doing here. That's that's the transportation stuff that was in operations and services. So you know, this is based on based on the draft framework and um, distribution of things between the three committees. This is what was put in our draft. These two bullet points here. So you know not much here. And then when I when I said hey we we don't have a whole lot of meat here. And Andrew let me know that the health and wellness group had some additional stuff in there. So go to the next slide, Alyssa. 
So health and wellness has a lot of stuff about transportation. I thought it would be good if we also look at this because we are ops minded people, even if we're kind of drifting into health and wellness's lane, I don't think they'll mind it. Um, they are, they're actually slated to talk about this on Tuesday. So maybe they're listening right now and maybe this will help them with their discussion. Um, so uh, I know that a lot of what, you know, when people talk to me about this work that we're doing right now, they say, you know, the, to get them to school, you got to get them on a bus. And that's kind of a funnel where they're all coming together. And, you know, how do we, how do we do this? And I said, I don't have the answer, but, um, you know, we, we need to discuss transportation. So let's go back. Um, let's see. Hopefully everybody got a chance to look at all this stuff. So the first, our, our, our part of this, go back to 21 for a minute. So does anybody have any comments about this slide here before we drift over into the health and wellness lane? Or just yes. general comments on transportation? Yes, okay. Natasha, go ahead. Um, bullet one, I would update, say, disinfect that high touch areas, such as the entrance railing between each route and the other high touch areas after the morning and afternoon, um, after the morning and final afternoon run, the concerns would be um, only doing so once a day um, could expose a lot more students to the high touch areas and um, which is the railing. So I think it should be done after each route because it's quick to do. Um, and maybe the seats can be done after the morning run. And then again, after the afternoon runs are all completed. I agree that could that's something that could fall into their pre-trip and post-trip uh, inspections. And of course, if if they feel that there's something in between, you know, if they get time in between, they can clean at, you know, use their own, um, you know, just use their, you know, their own opinion if they think that it should be wiped down before then, like if a student sneezes or something, if the, you know, I don't know. The bus driver wants to pull over and just kind of wipe things down real quick they can do so they could just use their discretion um bullet two it does make sense um but there will be there will need to be a message sent to parents regarding how to social distance at the bus stops because we don't have really have control of the students until they get on the bus i mean districts can make efforts to separate the students um at the stops or student the rather the stops not the students at the stops but there will still be a large number of stops that can't be separated because buses can't navigate down all the narrow roads all right great point and also some safety aspects need to be reviewed especially for the students that are loading and unloading if they're crossing like at a hub stop, which could lead to more safety risk during the process. It could, um, so maybe we can evaluate that before guidance is um, made. When, when you talk about safety risk, are you talking about people blowing through the stop signs on the bus because they're impatient? Um, with the amount of time that it's taken to unload and load? That could be, that's that's always an issue. Um, it's blowing um, through the stop sign and the lights. Um, but also students crossing at hub stops, sometimes they're kind of huddled and they like to you know, congregate walking across the street. Um, so, and, you know, kind of, we kind of want them to kind of cross like, I hate to say like ducks in a row kind of and not kind of scatter and go everywhere when they go so they there won't be social distancing when they're crossing across the road. They'll kind of be bunched together. If that makes sense. Andrew, do you does um do the groups anticipate that there's going to be some kind of federal or CDC or some kind of guidance on bus transportation in general? I, I can't imagine that that's not somehow going to come out. Do you, do you have there, is, there is CDC guidance uh, already, Chuck, and, uh, and most of it is around utilization, right? So they are recommending, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, 50% uh, capacity um, in terms of utilization rates, which, quite frankly, we know is going to be very, very uh, hard, if not uh, 
if not impossible, um, because it effectively means you need to double routes, uh, routes or or um, or get creative with scheduling. And so, you know, I think uh, I think there's a set of uh, that recognize the the public health um, you know recommendations from CDC, but also. Uh, are feasible for local folks to implement, and um, and I think you know a lot of the the uh, the next slide um, will uh, will will get into some of that, and would certainly uh, be beneficial to hear from folks on the ground how they're thinking about what we can do to make this as feasible as possible, given uh, given the recommendations that have come down from CDC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm 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 glad you glad you're knowledgeable on that. I think part of what we do here is. Um, Maybe add, be familiar with CDC guidance for ops and services. And um, before we see if there's any more hands on this one, I just, uh, in, in talking with colleagues about this one, especially transportation, I caught myself saying, uh, we can't, we can't a couple times. And I, I thought, well, you know, I can't be that way. I have to, I need to think of, you know, if, if we're in this tough situation, um, how can we make things happen? Um, what, what do we need to do to, to um, study the situation and be as knowledgeable as possible. Mentally, it's tough for me because either way, there are some of these operational things that might kind of force us to treat it as if there is minimal spread or, or um, significant spread because you know, operationally, a lot of these are extremely difficult. But um, I think we still need to think these through and try to think of what we would do if if say you know the health the health situation and the governor said hey look these we have to have a middle ground so um, they're the ones that will determine what we do um, any other hands for this slide before we go on to the the juicy slide chuck i'd like to just piggyback on on the capacity issue and being able to do these because like you i felt my saying we can't we can't um and then it dawned on me when you're talking about capacity We've been strictly focusing on, you know, having enough buses and doing additional loops. Um, we can also en enable additional capacity. It may not be a popular decision, but um, right now we go to school five days a week. There's nothing that says that we probably can't go seven days a week uh, and stagger how it's done. I know it's a nightmare to kind of track, you know, hours and things of that nature, but giving you two more days helps increase the cap capacity to teach. Um, I know that's kind of maybe a way out of the box thought, but you know, you have seven days to teach versus five, and that helps give additional capacity um, for transit. We do have one hand up. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Thank you. Um, this may be something that's within the CDC guidance, um, and we or maybe in the slides as we go forward that it's already being covered. Uh, but we talked about in the classroom, the potential for plexiglass being placed for the, um, the desks. Uh, is that a consideration that we should add here uh, for the buses? Um, you know, you know the, the capacity for the buses we're talking about going, you know, 50% or whatever, but still, uh, is there a need for the plexiglass as well? So, yeah, one. One additional bullet on ops and services could be research and understand um, mitigation um, measures available to school transportation. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure, it, you know, if there's a need for shields that go between seats, somebody's selling them, whether they're safe or not. You know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know that market, but um, we'll we'll add that. You know, take a look at uh, studying that. Any other hands? Yes, Stacy and then Heath. Hi, I think um, we also need to consider, I know with the transportation and, and the closing, if um, we do close, you know, say for five days or two weeks or whatever, um, we need to think of how transportation will be utilized um, for students who need food, because we did that um this summer and i know that goes into the meals we're not talking about that but that does include that the staffing for that um so we do need to think about that and how that impacts um you know if some of our parents are transporting back and forth another thing with transportation if a kid is sick um and we can't, and the parent doesn't have a vehicle to come and pick up the child um or grandparent and they can't get anybody 
Um, we probably need to establish some procedures about, um, you know, they still can't go on the bus and follow that um, because I know we should have a, you know, a designated area in the building. Um, but that, you know, is another staff time and making sure I'm watching all of that. So with all of this, I know, you know, and I've done some research this week um, and transportation for just cleaning um, and increasing the equipment um, will increase the funds about 10%. So I know that's not our thing, but I want to put that down. Um, that that is what um, at least 10%, you know, I think overall um, from a number of them, school superintendents association, association of school business offices, um, they've said about 20% to every um, budget. So if we're looking at that, um, you know, I think that encompasses all three groups, but we need to keep, I just want to make sure that we're looking at the funding um, and along with transportation the equity um, of that. So I want us not to forget about um, that. And I know we've talked a little bit about students with special needs um, and how that impacts, um, you know, social distancing and things like that. You know, when I hear I, you know, I don't work in an elementary school, um, but when I used to, and I used to be a principal and a teacher of an elementary school, and I do not know how you're going to be on a bus um, with 25, 40 kids that are first grade, second grade, third grade, um, with, and the bus driver is responsible for making sure they are socially distancing. Um, you know, that can't be the responsibility. So I think also with transportation, we need to look at the funding impact of hiring other people to sit on that bus um, to assist if that's our, you know, our goal. So I'd like that noted, please. Really noted, good ideas. I don't know if uh, everybody knows, but I mean, our bus contractors, they're not making a, a ton of profit. So 10 to 20% increase in costs for them, if that's what it is, you know, that's not something easy for them to, um, to absorb. Um, any other, uh, we had another hand after Sherry, right? We did Heath and then Natasha after that. Yeah, I know when we, when we think about transportation, we think about buses, but we're going to have to look at our protocols for uh, like parent drop offs at, at all of our schools, especially our elementary schools, because we're going to have an influx of parents that are not going to have their kids ride buses. And so our, our principals and you know, our dean of students and our buildings are really going to have to look at those those systems and, and try to figure out how to how to coordinate the buses coming in and the parents coming in, knowing that, you know, there's going to be a, an influx of cars uh, on the property. So. Um, you know, I just think that's something we need to make sure we, we include in the transportation. Was it Natasha or somebody else next? That's right. Um, I just wanted to say about the plexiglass, it violates the FMVSS regulations on buses. Um, FB, FV, FMVSS 205 says you can't add. I figured it violated something, you know, it's, but you know, there's probably somebody out there trying to sell it, right? Yeah. Um, other thing I want to say is um, the vans, homeless for homeless and population. Everyone, we're talking about buses, but let's not forget our van riders. They're about five to six in a van sometimes. So how do you social distance in vans? How will we get to and from school also? Another good one. Um, any other hands before we move on and um, invade the health and wellness lane? Nope. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, take another look and um, you know when we start getting hands, we'll, we'll go ahead and start talking. So this is the stuff that the health and wellness committee is tasked to look at. Um, I think, think uh, Andrew might have uh, said that some of these are based on the uh, CDC guidance that is received to date. Chuck, we do have a hand up. Um, Representative Postles would like to talk. Okay, go ahead. 
Second bullet point, buses should operate at half their normal capacity with one student per seat. I know Andrew mentioned that just a little bit. So uh, <clears throat> what happens to the other half of the, of the population? Um, that's, that's not a small item. Uh, not a small item. In a former life, I drove school bus for a while, and um, that is a that is a big a big consideration. And 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 honestly, um, I know a couple of us have said, "Well, we can't, we can't," but I think we have to give some real serious consideration of that. Uh, we we. We do not have the uh, ability under current situation to add drivers. Drivers are at a premium right now, and uh, and buses. Uh, so buses are, at, you know, space on at a, at a premium. So I think that um, <clears throat> we might have to. I understand their concern about that, but if we're going to go, and that may be part of the determination of a go no go situation but if we if we're going to go i think that we're not going to be able to go at half capacity or something like that that's i think that's very impractical and i guess the second thing that i would say is <clears throat> on the fifth bullet point all windows should be open at all times to facilitate airflow that works okay on a day like today except it's raining right now <laughs> But as it gets cooler, particularly in the mornings, that's that's not going to work so well either. Uh, it, it's you know uh, we may have some windows cracked, some, but to say all windows are open at all times, uh, I think uh, I think that's something that's got to be looked at. And I can I can tell you that uh, some some have policies that the windows never get open all the way from a safety standpoint, depending on the age of the kids and so forth. So, um, uh, you know, I just think that's those are two things that, as they are stated there, I, I think that we would uh, I would suggest that we we do a little pushback there because I, I just don't think those two things are practical. Thank you. Um, just some comments on different, I mean, not, not that I've heard in Delaware, but just, you know, trying to read as much as I can online. And there's some places suggesting, you know, lower bus capacity. And then how do you do that? It might be that your, um, your high schoolers are doing online learning and your middle schoolers are going to high school and, you know, and you, so you're, you're reducing the number of kids in the schools. That's for another group, I think, to explore. But those kind of things have to, if if we're if we're going to be uh, um, following this recommendation, um, if we were if we were to have to, there would have to be some other things that come along with it. Um, some have suggested potentially half the kids remote learning, half the kids at school. But then I have to you have to worry about you know your staff at the, at the school. Well, what are what are their kids doing for half the time if they're at school and they're young and you know, daycare is a consideration. So um, I'm not just trying. I'm not trying to sharpshoot all this stuff, but there are a lot of dominoes that 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 fall when you yes. do some of these things. Um, do we have other hands at this point? We do, um, Natasha, and then Senator Sokola. I have a bullet two. Some comments about that. Um, this is actually more than half the capacity for elementary, which holds 72 students. Um, so this would allow for 24 students with one in each seat. Um, this would be a 24. This would be 24 for middle school and high school students per bus, and this will impact the times as the majority of the buses are riding close to capacity. Right. This. This will force the districts to have to operate at different times to limit the number of students as buses will have to do more routes, which would entail increase the time for drivers and have increased financial impact. And the shortage of drivers prior to COVID was already an issue, um, and we're not sure how many will return. Right. The ones that could high, be high risk. So no additional buses will um, 
it just, I don't think that will work. Right. So the number of buses and drivers we have could be a limiting factor unless we could work in DART or some other way or unless parents are transporting. But the, the note that I made from this is a 72 student bus will be down to 24 students and it would most likely force districts and charters to have to operate. And, and my other thing with that, just off of that, Chuck, with DART, DART is good for the in-town kids, but not necessarily for the students who are in a rural area. That won't work. Yes. Um, so moving to bullet three, um, are you saying that students should have their own hand sanitizers or should there be hand sanitizer provided um, as the students enter board the bus? Because this would also impact finances. This is what the CDC said. So uh... my other thing to, to that is um, students that have allergies and sensitivity. Mm. That's really a good point. These are some sense in just you know doing this every day per se. It's it's you know different sense on the bus the trigger students if they have asthma and things of that sort. So I'm not sure how that will work, even though CDC says um, bullet four face coverings for drivers may need um, to make sure that we don't restrict the vision while they're driving if they're sliding. If they wear glasses, <laughs> um, school bus aides should be provided face shields. I think I touched on this last week, provided face shields because, you know, they're in close proximity of the students um, on our special needs buses. When they're assisting, buckling in the wheelchairs, fastening their seat belts, maybe caring for, you know, a runny nose or things of that sort. Um, and students that may have health risks are not able to wear face masks. Second, students, with yeah. students with health risks, and maybe even, um, yeah, risk that might be a risk factor too. Mm -hmm. and then the next one would be drivers being made aware of what students can or cannot do to health concerns, and who would be responsible for ensuring that masks are worn. And will transportation be denied if a student tries to board the bus with, you know, without a mask? And who would create those policies or those guidelines? All right, so consider consider policies, et cetera, for compliance. Yeah. Um, bullet five. Someone kind of touched on this a little bit with the windows being down. Some students, some concerns are some students uh, with 504s and IEPs require AC. Um, we also have drivers that have health issues who must operate on AC. Um, buses with air conditioner. So the windows down will not provide the required temperature um, deemed for their health. Inclement weather and rain, even with a cracked window, a little bit of rain still comes into the bus. That's an issue. Um, this would be the case of all temperatures. Bus heating will be impacted with the windows open, hotter and colder temperatures outside. Um, it's, it's pretty broad guidance that could cause more conflict if more guidelines um, around when and how are not developed. And then bullet seven. I'm sorry, you guys. I have a, it's, it's a lot more transportation. I think I'm about done. <laughs> um, I'm going to take us to six. No, I'm not going to take us to 630. Um, and bullet seven, cleaning. I would um, maybe we can add consult the bus school, the school bus manufacturer for approved guidance regarding disinfecting materials and guidelines for cleaning to ensure um, that no damage occurs to the bus. Um, I do know that when this happened, we did receive some some guidance on one of our um, bus manufacturers on how to properly clean because you don't want to damage the seats or you know any other things. Then that's an added cost trying to get those things fixed. Um, Diluted bleach is a no-no, <laughs> can be used on seat belts or on the fabric, so we have to find another solution for that. And bullet seven kind of um, kind of contradicts bullet one on page 21. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you guys for your ear. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for doing your research. So any more hands at this point? We have about uh, 15 more minutes. 
for uh, for tonight. So we can we can keep discussing this one. Yes, um, Senator Sicola. Okay, Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, on on bullet two, um, we could have uh, an exception for siblings or people from the same household. Um, and I, I had a different thought on bullet four on the windows. Um, it says up in bullet one that the risks haven't been studied and, and I'm not sure um, that, I mean, intuitively that seems right, but I, I my fitness center opened yesterday and I taught a class today at a cycling studio and they specifically said, do not turn on the fans. So, so there must be some uh, benefit as well as some cost related to airflow and I'm not sure what it is. So we may wanna look at that one uh, just, just to make sure. And, and certainly if you had windows open, you would only want them open when weather permitted. So that was all I had. <laughs> Thank you. Any other hands? Stacy, did you have an additional comment? I do, yes. Um, I I want to piggyback a little bit on the um, masks. And I think, you know, another piece to remember is some students um, of all ages may have some sensory issues with masks. Um, there are some, um, you know, that have some trauma in wearing a mask. Um, is not going to work so that needs to be thought of um, and also if there are any students with um, who are lip readers or uh, use that we need to think about use um, purchasing clear masks so that is not a deterrent and that includes bus drivers front office staff and everybody um, like that i did also want to mention the dart piece when i brought that up last week um, i you know um, i am not a transportation person but I did mention that, yes, I was aware of Sussex County um, would need new routes. I don't, I mean, they're, it's not strong down there um, with, with a lot of empty um, buses that are currently running. I would, you know, that's why I suggested maybe looking at, um, at that for schools as an option. You know, I know they're not built up for that, but I don't know. I'm not transportation, but looking at doing new routes to make sure that everybody is still employed um, because it may not be they're not to full capacity um, and that may be an option for even high school um, students and if that's the case maybe um, make some space on some other buses you know i don't i'm trying to think a little bit more outside too um, you know i know it is much easier as most things are in newcastle county um, i've worked um, in sussex county for many years um, so I'm aware of that, but yeah, I mean, transportation, I think is a huge one, but we do need to consider all the, you know, the mask things. I think that is very important. Um, if we are going to build some policies and recognize that, you know, sometimes we take, we create policies, um, you know, with, with for clarity and for um, health factors, but we also need to look at our vulnerable, most vulnerable population and um, make sure that it, we're not um, creating the policy that is not fair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, just uh, glancing at some of the YouTube comments, there's one about if if the AC is on, that the filter must be must be replaced. So I don't know much about that, but I think that that's that's something that if we do the AC, that that's probably consideration. And there's something about checking temperatures, and I know that that's squarely within the health and wellness, but I didn't know if that. Um, Andrew, do you recall if that temperature checking in buses was part of the CDC stuff? I don't recall, um, and I know uh, I know there was a, a pretty robust conversation about uh, about temperature checks on Tuesday calls relative to school entry. Uh, I'm I'm not sure uh, if they got to transportation, and I I don't know if the CDC is recommending anything related to to temperature checks before staff or students get on to, to buses. Okay. Any other hands? We have we nine do. minutes left. We have a couple of hands. Um, Senator Sokola, then Natasha, then Jeff. I just forgot to put my hand down. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Natasha, go ahead. My thing is piggybacking off of the temperatures. 
that would probably that would really um, stall load time um, for students going come, coming onto the bus, especially if it's a hub stop. The driver would have some some hub stops have over 20, 30 kids or plus. So I if if a temperature check is required, that's um, that will take a long time. So I'm not sure how they would do that. Um, if they did require that, maybe consistent on the bus to do so. But I'm not sure if the driver could remain in their seat, take temperature, keep the eye on the road, making sure kids aren't, you know, running across the road. Um, yeah, that's a lot to be expected of a driver to do that. So we understand that transportation is going to be a difficult situation to deal with. And it's no matter what we do, whether parents are bringing students to school or we're doing temper checks or whatever, uh, the simple matter is that getting to and from school is going to take a lot more time. And so maybe the other committees, I think there's an instructional committee need to be thinking about a modified um, lesson plan or, or as far as the number of hours or classes that they teach in a day. Because I can already see this adding, you know, an hour to almost two hours on the day just for transportation. So that cuts down, you know, the five and a half hour, cuts down, you know, to five and a half hours of teaching time. Uh, just to be able to accommodate getting to and from school with all these uh, additional items. Yep. <laughs> all right. Next hand. Do we have more hands? We do. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, Chuck, I just wanted to build on the issue of the temperature check. As Andrew said, there was a rather robust conversation on Tuesday night health and wellness. And actually, the issue of moving it from the entry point of the school building back to the entry point on the bus was raised by somebody. Um, they articulated the concern that, you know, we could have kids on the bus, someone could come in, have a temperature. Are we then creating a worse situation by not moving it back? Um, so that is something that they flagged. And I think Natasha's points are a good one that. That's going to happen. We need how to, we need to figure out how we're going to implement that. And, and I said this before, I've seen a number of people articulate that this whole thing is causing us all to think about different jobs and how we do the job differently. And it may be that we may, we may need to consider additional personnel. You know, someone who is going to be at that bus stop to do those temperature checks in advance of that bus getting there so that all clear kids can get on the bus that's sort of a rolling scenario uh, i don't envy people in oliver or natasha's positions logistics is going to be an incredible challenge in reopening school come fall exactly great point any other hands that's it for right now we have five minutes Okay, we'll give it a give it another few seconds, and then um, we'll move on. Okay, no more hands at this point. No more. Okay, let's move on to slide twenty three. So right. next is that me, Chuck? <laughs> is that you? That is you. You know what? I did. I delayed because I was watching the screen on YouTube, and there's a, there's like a five second delay. Go ahead, all. Yes. <laughs> so Sorry. our next meeting is uh, June 18th from five to six thirty. Uh, we'll continue with this moderate community spread scenario, uh, focusing on operations and technology protocols. Um, but we will also kind of do a quick review of what we talked about today. Uh, we'll send information out for you to read ahead. Um, we'll take all feedback from this meeting and update the draft essential uh, actions and reshare this with the group in advance of the meeting. As a reminder for the public, uh, we are accepting public com comment via email at reopeningideas at doe.k12.de.us or by voicemail at 302-735-4244. Right. 
and thank you everybody for um, for participating and for your ideas. And um, I want you to stay well. And please, um, if you're one of our YouTube watchers, um, I saw a lot of great ideas and, and things to consider coming across the chat. Please do um, put that in an email or, or put it in a phone call and send it to us so that we can um, incorporate that in what we're doing. Thanks, and everybody have a great evening and see you next week. Stay well.